maintain that um, the revolutionary character and a revolutionary strategy of 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 armed resistance of our right to self-defense. And I just wanted to say all of this to say that at this point, you know, um, you know, I don't have much longer to be here amongst you to have these conversations, but I just want to try to depart to you the, the essence of this lesson that that there can be no justice in America for people of African ancestry without a democratic distribution of the pain. Ebony barbaric hieroglyphs, I spit my gifts, shift your surface with vernacular skill, the rawest lift, touching down like meteors, none other than black gods, stones in my timepiece coming from black stars, negativity for keep far away from doors, single-mindedly destroying the ops and the odds, just another warrior's quest, the past may get rest, demons coming for my crown, get beheaded like the next, these blessings never threats, just a verbalizing message, catching energy to create Critics, all the Atari get dead in. Pray I stay alert on the field, be schematic. And anything my enemies deal, be dead actions. I proceed this life I lead beneath it. So many seas to win it's our time to align stars to spirits lead. Who could war with me? Catastrophically or audibly, given no choice by God's law, I'm Lucifer on streets. Why I say that is because. Without consequences for injustice, injustice will persist. There has to be a democratic distribution of the pain before there's democracy in this country. You see, and um, every people that achieved their liberation, they understood this basic fundamental idea that until you started sending them crackers home in body bags, they weren't gonna talk about peace. They were not gonna talk about um, they're not withdrawal or or or, um, or 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 your empowerment. Nowhere has imperialism um, imposed itself. Did the people didn't the people didn't have to rise up and and throw them out. And that doesn't mean that there aren't other methods of of resistance and struggle. We need an abolitionist movement. And the abolitionist movement includes many facets in the black community that, that are about abolishing institutional white supremacy and, and white racist control over our, over our daily lives. That's one thing. But the underlying factor is that the monopoly of violence that the state has and that it uses against black people is designed to control and deny us our own sovereignty, our own right to self-determination, our own ability to live a life, to live lives as free people. And um, they only understand the significance of what they're doing when they have to cry at funerals like we do, when they have to, when they have to go and um, and bury their loved ones when they are the victims of of the of the violence that they perpetrate. Now, people say that violence never never achieves anything. Well, that's true to a certain degree, but we need to understand that um, politics, political power, is is exercise not just in um, civil and um, social struggle. It's organized, it's the ability to organize your own ability and capacity to inflict on people who will oppress you consequences. So today you have hashtag movements, you know, and we see what's happening with the hashtag movements, you know, the hashtag Black Lives Matter movement, you know, it should have been hashtag Black Liberation Movement. But it wasn't. It, and, and so it was co-opted. It was encapsulated. Um, this encapsulation process is something that the enemy is very good at. They're very good at that. And um, we have always been taught since the day that we were brought over here. And, and, and this is another thing I like to um, emphasize, um, that our presence here is a consequence of an act of war. 
an act of war against African people. Chattel slavery was an act of war. Hmm? And that war continues to this day. And as long as the white supremacist construct of America maintains itself and maintains this power, we're always going to be in this position. So we need to understand that although there has to be a democratic distribution of the pain, we also have to break, build a mass abolitionist movement, a movement where black people begin to think and vote and organize for their own self-interest. And that means an understanding of not only race, but class. Because I'll give you a current example. When this piece of shit written out, this little pussy um, um, got busted, when he went to, when he, the people that he killed were white kids who supported our struggle, who supported our right, our humanity. They were white allies. Hmm? When the weather underground went underground, they were allies of the Black Liberation Army. Right. When when the when the Palestinians, the PLO and the PFLP, um, um, wage struggle and continue to wage struggle against the European settler state, they were our allies. Hmm? So we really have to understand that. They are black enemies of black people based on class. And that there are allies of African people based on class. And it's very important to have that analysis because the pork chop nationalists will come along and tell you, you know, well, we ain't talking to white folks, all the white folks is devils and all of that bullshit, you see? But I got comrades and I had comrades that were in the trenches with me for years and that died on the front line, whether they were the David Gilberts, whether they were, you know, the John Browns always existed and have always fought for the right of humanity. Our struggle is not just for our empowerment. Our struggle is to liberate the whole of humanity. That's right. And so I just want to say that so we don't get trapped off into thinking that when those allies were killed by Rittenhouse, they didn't have nothing to do with us because they weren't black. Those white kids wouldn't have been there if it wasn't for our struggle. You see, they came in support. The Marilyn Bucks, who, who helped us facilitate our ability to strike at the enemy, they were white. So I just said that to say, that this is not just a struggle against um, against uh, against a white supremacist capitalist construct, and that all white people are are our enemies. It's not that. It's not that. It's not like that. That, unfortunately, um, this this white supremacist construct that is America has duped its own people. I mean. If you look at the followers of Trump, I mean, they 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 dumb as rocks. I mean, you can't get more stupid than some of them crackers. Them crack. I mean, I ain't never seen no crackers this stupid. Even the old Ku Klux Klan wasn't this stupid. I mean, these these crackers is locked on stupid. You see, and 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 the other and the other half, the ones that understand that 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 they're living in a lie. That this is a lie. Um, the other, the other white folks are ashamed of these people. They are ashamed of the Donald Trumps. This is why they try to, you know, rationalize them and say, well, you know, he's crazy, he's a criminal, and he's this, and, he's, and he is all of that. But, you know, when you actually have a sit down and you talk to the orange man, you see that this cracker is stupid. This is, a, this is one of the stupidest crackers I ever seen in my life. And he's from New York, so I'm, I'm telling you this firsthand. You see, and and um, so he and he comes from a long line of stupid crackers. See, he ain't like he ain't like the first generation. You see, so reason why I say that is because it's there's a saying that you know if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. 
But what's not said and what needs to be said that there's a vignette to that. There's two there's done two more parts to that. Yeah, if you know the truth, the truth will set you free, but you have to act on the truth. You can't just know it and don't do nothing about it. And second of all, you have to know the lies that change you up in the first place. You see, those two things go with know the truth and the truth will set you free. And the other thing is, as it said in the Quran, that it says to the Muslims, it says, oh, ye who believe, who will stand for those who are oppressed and who are and who are maligned and who are poor and who have no power, if not but you? Because you're the best evolved of humankind. You enjoin what's right and you forbid what's wrong. And that's our mantra. We have to enjoin what's right and forbid what's wrong. And that means that we really have to try to live a moral and ethical way of life and fight our struggles based on that morality and ethics. Now, that's not to say that we're not, we don't have weaknesses. That's not to say that we won't make mistakes. That's not to say that some of us will get so caught up in our own egos that we forget why we're doing this and where we are at. We all make those mistakes. But the bottom line is that this struggle that you are engaged in, that you've committed yourself to, is about the whole of humanity. That, oh, go, go ahead, keep going. Keep but going, I just, I just wanted to say that, and I just wanted to let you all know that although I might be, I might be old and see now, and um, I might sound crazy and shit, but um, I, 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 I just want you to understand what I meant when I said that oppressors will continue to oppress you until there's a democratic distribution of the pay. Basically. In, in a nutshell, that's saying power only respects power. And, Absolutely. And, and what you're saying, and in regards to COINTELPRO, basically, this, it was the, it was about the stripping of our power, which, like you said, uh, moves us away from the idea of self determination. Question I got with you on that is, uh, what are your in, your your inputs on why the younger generations are not as politicized as you were with your upbringing in regards to that because what i what i find with with the uh, modern modern people that are operating within the panther party is that they're, they're they they do not they don't in, embody the essence of what you're talking about when you talk about self-determination and all that goes into that because it's like it's one people think that voting means something whereas they don't and even when they when they reject voting, the point is they don't understand what it what it means to self governance and, and to hide that what what all it goes goes into attempting to be a free people in terms of governing ourselves the accountability and responsibility of forming your 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 own as a people and it seems like that work has been evaded and lost within the younger generations. Well, I I I, I think that. One of the reasons is, like I said, you have a generation that's not in touch with their own radical history and tradition. We don't, we're not, we're not in touch with it. You know, each generation stands on the shoulders of the generation that went before. And, and the success of COINTELPRO was the success that they aimed at, was to cut off and disconnect one generation from the other in terms of leadership. That's always the objective. Of, of counter revolution and counter um, uh, uh, movements, counter to uh, to armed struggle of, of people struggling for their freedom. The the reason why the Vietnamese people won their war after fighting the, almost a thousand years against Chinese occupation, went then beating the French at Dien Bien Phu and running them out in 1954, and then comes the Americans in 19 in the 1960s and they fought them and they wound up leaving on helicopter skids the reason why they won is because they didn't get the memo that they were supposed to lose see we've been taught that no matter what we do we can't win 
Mm. You know, back this goes all the way back to the plantation. Where you gonna run to? You can't get away from white folks. They're everywhere. Where you gonna run to? Well, some of us ran off and and hung out with the Seminoles. Some of us ran off and 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 hung out with the native people. And some of us just said, "Feet don't fail me now," and followed the North Star. You see, but the the the, the thing is, is that we were brainwashed into and coerced into believing that we could not win. So therefore we had to resist and, 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 and for freedom, for our own humanity and freedom, according to the parameters of the, what, they, what our enemies have set down. And when I say enemies, it goes back to what I said. Our presence here was an act of war. Still is, yeah. You see? And so the whole objective of counterintelligence program was not only to prevent us from thinking as a sovereign people, but to forget, but to take into account that we could not win. That if, that, that if you read the memos, some of the memos, they said that the youth had to believe that to become a revolutionary would be a dead, to become a dead revolutionary. That it's better to be, you know, a, a, a movie star or, a star or someone who enjoyed the, um, the appreciation of white society or the, or the larger society than to be a revolutionary. Well, that's still true. We the only people that have sport fig sports figures and basketball players and movie stars as our spokespeople, as our spokesperson. Nobody goes to Tom Brady and asks him what does he think about the U.S. involvement in the Ukraine. Nobody goes to these white boys, those baseball players, and asks them what do they think about, you know, gay rights. You see, but we the only ones that they go, they'll stick a mic in front of uh, an athlete and um, and unless the athlete has some type of grounding in his own history and some type of understanding and his own and his own limitations. I mean, how many athletes do you going to you see who would say, well, you know, I, I, I'm really not up on all of those details, but I know that such and such um, who's a black activist, you know, I, I, I support them. You see, so it's clear that um, the reason why this generation is the way it is is one, they're not in, they, they, they've been cut off from their own legacy of resistance and struggle. So they're fighting. So we wind up fighting battles and struggles that we've already won. Mm. And because the enemy has institutional memory, they understand what works and what doesn't. You see, and then too, you have you're living in the age of technology, of in, in which um, um, human human uh, alienation has been turned into a into the marketplace of narcissism. Everybody wants to be a star. They're on TikTok. They're on Instagram. They're doing their own videos. I mean, if you go on YouTube right now and and click black power you wind up with umar johnson lewis farrakhan and, and and brothers from the hood broadcasting in their car talking about how they got a straight line on why the cia is doing this as if they got a you know they get they get the straight wire from langley you know so so you know when you have this type of understanding you have to really see now that in your generation you have to begin to even question the idea the notion of nationalism because the whole world, as, as war would say, is a ghetto. The whole globalization has created a new form of imperialism. I call it New Age imperialism. No longer does an army have to invade a country and occupy it. All of the countries that are enthralled to USM to AFRICOM, they don't have American troops occupying their territory. You see? So, so everything is different for you. And then you've had a 50 year period when you had no movement. You had no real, you had no real movement. So what would you, what were you going to, what were you going to draw from? How would your generation, I mean, you had, yeah, you had the PCP, you had crack, you had heroin. You didn't have any movement. You see the, the, the poverty pimps that came out the war on poverty, they became the, 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 the members of the congressional black caucus. You see, they became the black capitalists, you see, that 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 tell you, you know, we need to keep the dollar in the black community as if that's going to change something. 
you see, or, or you know, now we need to be on Bitcoins. I mean, you have all of this crap going on because you didn't never had a movement that you could, you know, when, when, when I grew up by the grace of Allah, you know, I grew up, there was a movement, you know, um, when the music that came out in the sixties was a soundtrack to a movement, listen to the music power to the people, the shy lights, you know, um, listen to Curtis Mayfield. There's a hell below. We all gonna go. Fred is dead. God damn it. That's what I said. Fred is dead. Hmm. So we had even our culture reflected our consciousness and our movement. And, and that had to be sidetracked, which it was, you know, they threw money at, at some of these Negroes and, and now you got you know, little squirt talking about how big his dick is and how much money he got. You see, you ain't got no movement. You see, so I can't. I'm. I can't hold that really against you. I. You know, and some people will blame it on us and say, "Well, it's your fault because y'all didn't do this and y'all didn't do that." You know, <clears throat> yeah, maybe so, but I do know that the enemy has institutional memory and we don't have a memory of our radical history and our radical tradition. And when we do try to remember it, we remember it within the context of where we are at now. For instance, <clears throat> if you take the assassination of Malcolm, people always talk about who killed him. Well, we all probably, probably know who killed him. It's not who killed him, it's why he was killed. How many times have you, have you had a discussion on why Malcolm X was killed? <clears throat> why was Martin Luther King killed? Why was Fred killed? Why? You see? And when you start to discuss the why, then you'll see what the intentions were. The intentions wasn't just to eliminate a charismatic leader. The, ten the intentions were to prevent us from thinking as a sovereign people, from to prevent us from fighting for what we need, power. You see? So, so I can't... You, 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 you can't really hold it against um, younger folks that they didn't have a movement to draw from, to, 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 to nurture them into a different level of conscious. And then comes along technology and instant communications. And now we're part of a global village in which nationalism seems obsolete because the whole world now is connected. When, a, when if a cop beats up somebody in Hong Kong, it's on your tick. It's it's on your it's on your smartphone immediately. I mean, it might be even filmed in real time. Right. <clears throat> you see. So that right there, although it seems like it's a benefit, it's a great detriment because there's no face-to-face -face relationship anymore between people. You see. I I got a question real quick um, in regards to where you're going with the with with that that narrative. How does uh, the Republic of New Africa, in in regards to their their, their push push on uh, us coming together as a people and dealing with sovereignty, play into that as well as how would you what's your take on what uh, Charles Blow wrote in regards to the W note know, and 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 how he routes politics from a localized level like you're talking like like you spoke on earlier does those play a, into what we're we're, we're getting at. Well, yes, absolutely. I, like I said, in the nineteen, in the nineteen sixties, when the Black Panther Party came into existence from sixty-seven to sixty-nine uh, to seventy, before the split, um, we had um, the black, the black experience in America is woven into, and a consequence of many of the social and political and cultural dynamics of the white supremacist state of America. When urbanization occurred, when we moved north into the into the factories and into the and into the ghettos of the urban areas, it was a time when the United States population as a whole was becoming urbanized. Hmm? So what period of time was that? What was happening in the world then? Where was capitalism at that time? How did it affect us? All of these things were, were, were important. And one of the things that we have failed to realize is that going back to the fact that 
our presence here is an act of war. So therefore, everything that proceeded, that, that, that came after that, was to ameliorate, was to obfuscate, was to uh, misdirect that primary contradiction. So when when slavery was abolished, legal, uh, you know, chattel slavery, we went into what? We went into an area of sharecropping, semi-feudal system of sharecropping in the South. Okay, when feud, when 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 that was challenged and 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 urbanization began, I mean, we ran away from that. Okay, we went to the we got we hopped on the trains. Listen to the blues. Listen to your music. If you listen to your music, it tells you what we did back then and why. You see, we came to, we came to, we, you know, we, what was the end of the line for the, for the, for the trains coming out the South in the Southwest? The end of the line was Chicago where the cattle were, you, were brought. The cattle were brought to Chicago. That's where the slaughterhouses was. That's where we went. And what went with us the blues and what became out of that came r and came rhythm and blues, came urban blues. Huh? We went from muddy waters to, to, you know, to the temptations. You see, we have to understand that if we understand this process, whether it's social, whether it's political, this process, it made us into a people. And it's made us into a unique people. We are colonized in America. These ghettos that we are in are colonies. They're apartheid colonies. Black folks might mainly don't work in our black community because there's no jobs. They have to go get on the train, get on the bus, get on whatever transportation and go somewhere else and work and come back home. Where our districts are redlined. We don't have no economic power. We have all of the profiles of a colony, but we're not, we don't think as a sovereign people. So we don't even think us. We just think we're segregated. We just think that, you know, we're, we're, we're isolated and we got to break through this. So we have to reform this. We have to reform that. Black people didn't fight and die for a vote. They fought and died to be free, to be able to determine their own destiny. And voting was told to them or showed to them that if we could control our little community here, if we could control this, we could have a level of humanity and freedom that's not permitted. And what did crackers do whenever we did that? They came in and burned it down. They came in and destroyed it. What's Tulsa? You see? What's Virginia? They came in and destroyed it. Whenever we set up anything that empowered us, that made our humanity and our existence more, more, um, more beneficial to us, these crackers came and tore it down and burned it down. Why? Because we didn't have the ability or the capacity to exert a consequence on these motherfuckers when they did it. <laughs> You see, so we really have to understand that. So when the RNA comes along and they say free the land, what they, they have a fundamental recognition of this paradigm of power, this relationship of power. And they say, well, you know, in the, in the black belt in the South where we are a majority, you know, we should be able to control these territories. We should be able to control these regions because we're a majority. So if we were to use and exercise our um whatever uh, civil and human rights that we have uh, to facilitate that control, then, you know, we'd be good to go. You see what I'm saying? But now we know that that's not true because we have black faces in high places. We have more black leadership and more black political elected officials than we've ever had in our history. And so now when we look at these crackers that are murdering us, these police departments that are murdering us, they have black mayors, they have black police chiefs. You see, so what does that tell you? That the issue now is the national security state, the garrison state, the police state, that this state is what is thwarting our ability to live our lives in freedom and equality. And, 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 and so therefore we have, a, we have a, a stake in destroying the state the national security state, the same state that the white working class has in destroying this state because it's an oligarchy. It's ruled by the rich. It's influenced and controlled by money and profit. And the only purpose that we have in this state is as, as, is as consumers or prisoners, mm. you see? And, and so the state is all about control. It's all about control of the population 
It's all about control of the people's minds and, and aspirations so that people really now don't even think that they can win. Don't even think that they could, you know, that they could control their own destiny. So when someone comes up, like these hashtag movements, you know, when people respond with some knee jerk um, uh, responses, you know, like defund the police. I mean, what state, how is the police state going to defund the police? That's not happening. You could forget that one. Right. But that's just the response to the fact that the police are getting all of these monies in these urban budgets and the programs and education that needs to deal with public health care, that, you know, the deal needs to deal, you know, with, 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 with families and no money is going there. So they say, well, let's take the money from the police and give it to these programs and stuff. But you got police budgets that are like almost a two fifths of the whole budget for a city. Yeah. Hmm? So even if you, t even if you took a fifth of that away, they still got more money. They ain't, they ain't giving up their guns, you know? So what's the strategy? The strategy is not to defund the police. The strategy is to decertify the police union because the police are not workers. The struggle against the police has to be maintained as a, as a question of class and caste. Hmm? How many, how many movements, how many lawyers, what movement do you have right now that's talking about decertifying the police union and recon because they're not workers just that struggle alone will show people that the police are armed agents of the state and they're not under their control they have qualified immunity these crackers could blow you away tomorrow and don't have to say nothing to nobody for seven days and they get lawyers and all of this stuff and i mean you need to understand that these are the same people that if you were a worker and they decided to bust up your your, your picket line and declare your picket line illegal it would be the police to do it so they're not workers so we even have the misconception that the armed agents of the states are servants of the people when in fact they are agents of the political elite and the political power structure of the state. So we have to rethink the idea and the notion of the state, you see? And, 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 and so that's how we really begin to understand where we are at. First, we have to really understand that by many intents and purposes, we are a colonized people, a domestic colony. Hmm? So that therefore our struggle would proceed along different lines if we understood that. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean we exclude voting. No. But we do include our own political party. We do include having our own political representation. We talk about the police. We just not talk about them as not being workers. We talk about the command and control structure of the local police. So you talk about decentralization of the police. At the same time, you talk about community control, okay? These are struggles people could wrap their heads around, but when you start talking about abolish the police, then you have some old grandmother sitting up in, in the hood where the Crips is running all the dope downstairs, and she said, well, what are we going to do without the police? Right. You see? You, 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 you have to really understand the value of face-to-face -face organization of people and the use of slogans in a struggle. Slogans are very, very important because they distill the political idea and the notion and the political direction of the leading revolutionary organizations and progressive organizations. And this is why you see in the 60s, we had slogans like power to the people. Now, what are the pigs going to say? How are they going to co-opt that? Power to the pigs? Power to the police? How did, They couldn't co-opt it. So they tried another approach sympathy for the police they'll tell you they'll have a crack of car they have a policeman carrying a baby out of a burning building and say some will call him a pig you see so if you use a slogan like black lives matter man white folks say man all lives matter and and you realize if this was an act of war that we that's how we got here then you realize that white folks don't mind and we don't matter Mm -hmm. So so when you come up with stupid slogans, hands up, don't shoot, the universal sign of surrender, you're going to take to a protest to armed agents of the state and say hands up, don't shoot, because the last black man that was murdered was murdered with his hands up. 
So that's so you'll make a slogan like that. So that's supposed to symbol. This is what I mean about how a generation that doesn't have a movement becomes ignorant and they reinvent failure. You see, if we know that the mayors of major cities like New York, you got a piece of dog shit, Adams, that he's the mayor, he's the cop. He's always a piece of dog doo doo, you know, and 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 he's the cop, you know, and he's a cop. So. If we talk to if if we had if 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 we put on the ballot, if we mobilize people not to abolish the police, but to decentralize the command and control structure, decentralize the police. So the mayor doesn't get to appoint the police chief. That the communities and, and their community public safety boards determine who are going to be the officials that run the police department. That doesn't mean that the police aren't going to get trained. They got to be trained. That doesn't mean that 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 they're not going to have, uh, 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 um, you know, police skills and stuff like that. You know, to 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 manage law enforcement skills. But what it means is that we put ourselves, we 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 cut off the control from city hall. We cut off the control, the political control of the police. Because what happens when the when the politicians decide to run for office? They have to kiss the police's ass in order to get elected. And whose ass they got to kiss? The union. Yeah. The same union that claims to be workers. And they're not. You see? So he has to be a law and order guy. He has to talk about bringing back old, you know, old, old, you know, stop and frisk and all of this shit. You see? So we need to really understand that strategies and tactics in war to have a strategic vision is about bringing along the masses of people along around certain basic ideas and fundamental ideas that empower it. And they can see that it empowers them, you see? So, you know, the colony, the colonized need to take over the colonies, you see? And so that people could realize, I mean, why the, why have the white folks done what we supposed to do? They're the ones that's taking over community uh, review boards. I mean, community uh, uh, boards of education on the local level, huh? And they're banning certain types of books being taught. They're banning certain types of things is being taught. They're the ones that's gerrymandering the district. Lo all politics is local, you see? So then when we turn around, they're, they're passing, you know, anti-critical race theory uh, 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 legislation on the local level. Right. You see, on the local level, when the Black Panther Party in New York, one of its first struggles that we got involved in was the struggle um, against the United Federation of Teachers. When they went on strike and it was it was because there was a um, experimental uh, a school district called Ocean Hill Brownsville. And Ocean Hill Brownsville was a, was community control of education, and they fired the white teachers that were there because they were not inspiring and teaching black kids the way that we thought that they should be taught. So the United Federation of Teachers, the teachers union in New York, went on strike. Now, who comprised the UFT? The majority of the UFT were controlled by Zionists, that were white European Jewish teachers who supported the state of Israel, you see? So all of these things come into conflict when we start struggling for local power. You know, when I first met Aaron in, uh, in Texas, what was the beef about? The beef was about the the board, the, the community uh, uh, board of education. And when they showed up with guns in the local board, the, the, the media went crazy. But what happened? That school board that was predominantly white was predominantly white no more. Right. You see, so all politics is local. And if you don't have a face to face relationship with our people, then it's impossible to organize them. And one of the weaknesses is that of that right now is mass media and smartphones and technology. This prevents you from organizing on that type of level. You see, I mean, look how we're talking. We're talking on a Zoom. But where are we? We in like maybe four different cities in four different parts of the country. Now that's, that might seem like it's a good thing, which it is, but it has its drawbacks. Because if we were all in the same room right now, 
And we had to spend the night here kicking the Willie Bobo and doing whatever and smoking that good hemp that homeboy over there is, is smoking. You understand? You know, and 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 if if, if we had to do that, we'd have we'd be, we'd be coming up with some more with, with, with a deeper unity, a deeper sense of purpose. We got trust. We begin to have trust with each other, or we begin, we can establish principles. Well, anybody could be an internet revolutionary, and and you know, uh, an internet gangster. Talk all of this. Look at your homeboy Umar, Umar Johnson. I mean, look at check homeboy out, man. This, I mean, come on, man. You know, and and <laughs> I mean, and, and you could multiply him like by uh, by th- by a thousand. You see, and 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 when I say that, I'm not saying that to disparage him, so much as to show how ineffective, you know, even a good message can become because of the mass media, because the medium is the message, the medium is the message. You see, I mean, when we if we want to know about if we want to know about the Ukraine, do we go to Ukrainians? Basically, no. We go, we go to John John Hanna in in Kiev to find out the latest of what's happening. A, a reporter goes to another reporter to tell him what's happening, and then he'll pick some people out the crowd and say, "Well, tell him, oh man, they just blew up the, the, the school with the kids in it. Oh man, that's terrible. You see, so we get our perception of the reality that these people are going through through the media. You see, and so. Um, I don't know if I answered your question, but I, I, I hope I did. 